Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Invite you guys to worship with us. As we look to our Savior, life more abundant and free. Life more abundant and free. Turn our eyes upon Jesus. Look for me, His wonderful face. And the things. When we first in darkness, your word, your light, is lead us along. Your heart can win, you heavenly Father, calling us all to your Son. Calling us all to your Son, you say, turn. Him. 
we have come for just one thing all eyes are on Jesus we have come for just one thing all eyes are on Jesus all eyes are on Him all eyes are
Jesus, I slave to see. Jesus die for me. Yes, he died for me. Oh, the sun sets free. Oh, it's My father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am. There's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am. this time the privilege that we have to be here together as church and worship you Lord amen it's nice to see people here last two times I've done this we uh, didn't have people that was just me and Chad and Mike and Gustavo I think both times right so it's nice to see people here and while we've 
been having church this whole time, it's been a little different, but one thing that's been consistent is Chad and his messages, the technology that he's been working with, and the worship music. And I really appreciate all the time and the effort that is put into that. And I want to thank Gustavo and, and Mike, especially, and then Shelly and, and Crystal, and uh, Bree was involved quite a bit too, so for them and, and their contributions to that. So last week, Chad covered Matthew 23, 37 to 24, 2. And in his uh, sermon, he talked about the discussion that Jesus had with the disciples. And as they're leaving the temple, I just want to jump and, uh, with the disciples as they're leaving the temple. And this morning, I want to jump right in. Today, I've got a lot of classroom and a little bit of church, and I've got a lot of fish to fry and a short time to cook it, so we're going to just jump right in here. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. As usual, I want to set the scene for you. I like doing this. As Chad covered last week, Jesus and the disciples have left Jerusalem, and they've made their way to the Mount of Olives. Now, the Mount of Olives is about three kilometers from Jerusalem, so it's a pretty easy walk. I find the location that Jesus chooses interesting for two reasons. The first reason, and I have a picture of this location. Shelley took this. This is what they're looking at. Of course, this picture is of the modern city, but the old city would be the same outline. You can see indicated here by the wall. This is the East Gate that Chad talked about last week. Those are the, the mosques that are currently sitting. There's two mosques currently sitting on top of the Temple Mount. There's me and Shelley. She told me she wanted to pick the pictures, and I didn't let her, so I'll change it back. <laughs> I said I found this location interesting for two reasons. First reason is the location. The Mount of Olives, the elevation is 826 meters above sea level. Jerusalem sits at about 740 meters above sea level, so that means they could be sitting as much as 86 meters or 282 feet or 26 stories up above looking down on the city. From where they're seated, they'd have a clear view of the temple that Jesus told them would just be destroyed and the entire city of Jerusalem. So they're walking out of Jerusalem and Jesus tells them. Do you see all these things, he asked? Truly, I tell you, not one stone will be here, will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. He's telling them that the temple is going to be destroyed. Then he goes where he has the best view of the temple and the city. Maybe it's just for dramatic effect. The second reason is the significance of this location. And Chad talked a bit about this last week, and I'm going to touch on it again. There's a couple of verses in the Old Testament that talk about this spot where Jesus decides to have this conversation. Ezekiel 11:23, and Chad used this verse last week, the glory of the Lord went up from within the city and stopped above the mountain east of it. The mountain east of it is surely the Mount of Olives, and in this vision, which I will paraphrase, in the vision to Ezekiel, God is telling him that the Jews in captivity are the faithful ones, and that those still left in the city are the sinful, wicked ones. The Jews in the city, well, they would have thought the opposite. They're the faithful ones. Why? Well, because they're still by the temple. And, th and they thought that the temple would save them, and this is a reoccurring theme that we keep hearing over and over again. Now, God tells Ezekiel that his spirit is leaving the temple to be with the Jews that are in captivity in Babylon. But there is something holy about the Mount of Olives. God's spirit stops there just before leaving to go to Babylon. And when the people return from Babylon back to Jerusalem in 70 years, God's spirit also returns with them. And in chapter 43 of Ezekiel, it says God's spirit returned from the east over the Mount of Olives. Zechariah 14.4 says, On that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives east of Jerusalem, and the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west, forming a great valley, with half of the mountain moving north and half moving south. The disciples are currently sitting with Jesus, who is the Messiah, on the Mount of Olives, the place that the prophet Zechariah prophesied that the Messiah would stand when he comes back to establish his kingdom. Coincidence? I think not. I have entitled this sermon, That's a Good Answer. Shall we pray? God, we thank you this morning again for allowing us to actually physically gather here together. We thank you for this church. We thank you for the people who are here listening, for the people at home. Lord, we pray that your continued blessing would be on us as a church as we try and reach our community. 
We pray for your blessing as we, we strive to be what you would have us to be, Lord, and we just ask your blessing upon this service, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. So we're going to start over again. Verse 3. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, what, when will this happen and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? So Matthew is telling us that the disciples came to him. In Mark 13, Mark tells us that Peter, James, John, and Andrew came to him. And in Luke chapter 27, it says, they asked. So we know for sure that this is a private conversation with the disciples. So it's between the disciples and Jesus, either the 12 or the 4 or some number in between. The question they asked Jesus is twofold. They want to know, when will this happen and what will be the sign of your coming? Now, we need to remember what prompted their question. Truly, I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. Chad covered this last week. Chad is also, Jesus, not Chad, not Chad, Jesus, has told them that they're leaving the temple and that God's spirit is also leaving the temple. It's happening again. Just like the verse we just read in Ezekiel, they are walking out of Jerusalem and the disciples comment on the buildings and this is the reply that Jesus gives them. And they're walking by and I can imagine Jesus pointing at the temple when he says that not one stone will be left on another. They ask when and what sign, but then they ask a question that's interesting. They add, what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? The disciples get the temple will be destroyed. I think that they understand that Jesus and the Spirit are leaving the temple, and they also understand that Jesus is going to come back. But the way Matthew has worded this, we can see that the disciples are looking as, at these as parallel events rather than two separate events. The disciples are assuming that something as apocalyptic as the temple being destroyed would automatically trigger the other events to happen at the same time. The temple being destroyed would equal Jesus' return and the end of the age. That's what they're thinking. And they're thinking that this is going to happen together. Now, this conversation took place in about 33 AD, and Matthew is writing his gospel in about 60 or 65 AD. So when Matthew is recording his gospel, he has no idea in five or ten years that Rome is going to come and crush the revolt and destroy the temple. Matthew is writing to his church, and he has no idea how close the destruction of the temple is. And as we move into verse 4, there's something that's important for us to understand. In verses 4 to 9, Jesus is talking directly to the disciples. You will see Jesus uses the word you in these verses. And when he says you, he's not talking to you. He is talking to his disciples. He's meaning the people that are in this discussion. He's talking directly to them. And I'll point this out as we move along. But as we move into verse 10, things start to change, and Jesus starts to use more third-person terms this will help us understand, at starting with verse 10, Jesus is talking not just to the disciples, but to, in broader terms, maybe to his greater church as well as ourselves. So we had their question, and now we're going to have the answer. Four and five. Jesus answered, watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, claiming that I am the Messiah and will deceive many. So the disciples asked Jesus about the coming and about the end of the age, and Jesus responds with, Watch out that no one deceives you. I said I would and I will. Jesus says no one deceives you. He's talking to the disciples. So why would Jesus say this? Well, it's a warning. Remember, they ask about the signs of your coming. Jesus wants to make sure that they're not looking so hard for signs that, that they start to believe every sign they see. Does that make sense? Jesus wants them to be aware of being deceived from every angle, including inside the church. Now, Jesus is not talking directly to us here, but there is something for us to learn here as well. We see, the church, we see churches and Bible teachers get so wrapped up in looking for the signs of the end times that they start to think that everything is a sign. It's an easy rabbit trail to go down. This may be a dumb example, but I'm going to use it anyway, and if you hunt, you'll understand, and if you don't hunt, you'll have to listen anyway, and I hope it makes some sense to you. <laughs> but when I'm hunting, I can be sitting in the same hunting spot for five or six hours. Uh, or, don't worry, I have no theme music if anybody's thinking that. I, <laughs> when I'm hunting, I can be sitting in the same spot for five or six hours. But as the day gets to the end or the end gets closer, I find myself looking harder and harder for what I want to see. By the end of the day, because I'm running out of time, I want so badly for that moose to walk out of the bush 
that often I'll be staring at, through my binoculars at that uprooted tree that I've been staring at all day, but as the light dims, I look harder and harder because I want to see something. Oh, what's that? What's that? Yep. Yeah, I talk to myself when I'm out in the bush. Ron and Eric will understand the rest of you. Don't judge me. And you know what? The harder I look, the more I convince myself. Yep, it's moving. It's moving. That's a moose. That's a moose. <laughs> Eric's laughing back there. I look and I look, waiting for that moose to move again. But once I focus on it and I look at all the signs, I start to realize that I was just misleading myself. Still, that same turned over tree root that I've been staring at all afternoon. It was never a moose. Church, churches and some Bible teachers so desperately want Jesus to come back that suddenly things that are maybe normal occurrences become sign. Because they are looking so hard and they want to give them special significance. And if we're not careful, we can start to create signs for, of things that are not really there. The danger of this is that we can mislead ourselves as well as others, even if our intentions are good. And we shouldn't worry about this. God has this all set up. So stay focused on God, stay focused on the Bible. He'll let you know when this is going to happen. Now, Jesus also warns the disciples that many will come in my name, claiming that I am the Messiah and will deceive many. There may be some that come, and they may claim that they're the Messiah, but it's much more likely, probably much more likely, that we'll be deceived by someone or something coming in Jesus' name, and we'll be deceived that way. The only way for sure for them to not be deceived or to keep from being deceived is to keep their whole focus on Christ and his word. Remember, I think I've talked about this the last two times I've been here, always, always go back to your Bible. They said what? You say, where is that in my Bible? Verses 6 to 8. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these things are the beginning of birth pains. Again, we see the word you, because again, he's talking directly to the disciples. You will hear of wars. See to it that you are not alarmed. You is the disciples. Now, the period of from 30 to 60 AD was a relatively peaceful time in the Roman Empire. Matthew would be writing this, like we said, in 60 to 65 AD. Now, there were conflicts in the world at this time, but in the context of the Jewish people, it was a relatively peaceful time. But in about 68 AD, Rome would have its own civil war, and the Jewish revolt would start to get rolling in about 66 AD. To the Jewish people, this must have been, for some, a time of great excitement and living in absolute fear for others. And I want to try and put this into perspective for you, what they're going through. And I think this actually works. Maybe it doesn't. I guess you'll let me know. I want you to think about Canada. Now imagine Canada has been living under U.S. oppression for years. They're in control of our government. They're in control of what's left of our military. They're occupying the West Edmonton Mall, the Hockey Hall of Fame, and yes, even Taylor Field. I told you this was serious. Now how would you feel if a group of people decided to revolt? A group of crazy Canucks decides it's time. It's time to get under from, uh, out from under the thumb of U.S. tyranny and oppression. Can you imagine the stress and pressure people would be under? This is going to happen, whether you're directly involved or not. We are going to revolt against the largest, most advanced military in the world. In your heart, you might believe that it's time. This needs to happen. But in your head, you have to know that when this thing goes down, you are going to be absolutely crushed, destroyed. It would feel like the end of time, right? Wars and rumors of wars. This is what the Jewish people would have been going through between 66 and 70 AD when Rome would finally come and crush the Jewish revolt and destroy the temple. Now, history is full of troubled periods, both of wars, rumors of wars, each time in history has its share of famines and natural disasters. The disciples must not get this out of perspective or get panicked into imagining that each time something happens, the end is now. Jesus is teaching and talking directly to the disciples in prophetic terms about things that will happen before 
the destruction of the temple. Like most of the Bible, these verses can have applications for all Christians in all times. There are natural disasters many will experience, but we or they are not to think that the end is near each time there's a famine or an earthquake or a natural disaster. Just some examples. Jesus specifically says earthquakes, right? In about 62 AD, there was a large earthquake in Pompeii, and in 67 AD, there was also an earthquake in Jerusalem. Earlier, it was, there was an earthquake in Palestine. In Acts 16.23, it talks about an earthquake that was so violent, Paul talks about it, that it shook the prison doors open. Jesus also talks about famines. There, are fam- there was a, a large famine that spread all over the Roman Empire at about 46 AD, and this is mentioned in Acts 11.28. Now, these are examples of things that happened in their time. These are what Jesus was warning the disciples about. Things that are going to happen from when this conversation happens to when the temple is destroyed. Jesus is warning them of signs and wars, rumors of wars, famines and earthquakes. In verse 8, it says, all these are the beginning of birth pains. Jesus doesn't want the disciples to be chicken littles. Chicken littles? Yeah, whenever a world event happens, they're running around claiming that the sky is falling, that the end is near, that Jesus is coming back. And why would Jesus tell them this? Because he doesn't want them to be false prophets. Saying the end is near, then it doesn't happen, they would look foolish and lose credibility in their new church. Again, Jesus is talking directly to the disciples, but there's a lesson for us in this conversation as well. Jesus is telling them that these things are going to happen, but the end is still to come. These are only the signs of the beginning of birth pains. And all parents know that the experience you have with each one of your kids' births is different, right? With Parker, we got to the hospital about 7 a.m., I think. I should know that, shouldn't I? I think it was about 7 a.m. We waited all day. I remember Shelly having a nap. I remember waiting all day, watching a hockey playoff game. In, in the evening, the birth was very traumatic, and he was born at 11.59 p.m., we're in, the, we're in the room, and one clock said 11.59, the other one said 12.01. So we got to pick which day he was going to be born. So I, when I phoned my dad and I said to him, well, Parker was born, and blah, 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 and uh, I told him the story, and he says, well, pick, pick the 11.59, he'll be able to retire a day sooner. <laughs> so Parker's birthday is May 31st instead of June 1st for that reason. Now, with Kobe... Shelly was wheeled in, and Kobe was born an hour later. The nurse's strike was on, and it was me and the doctor. That's it. Nobody else in the room. No one else was there. And everything was easy. Well, for me, it was easy anyway, but... (laughs) I think this is just proof that you don't know. That's why he uses the example. You never know how long this is going to take. And Jesus is telling his disciples that this is just the beginning of the world's woe. It's just the beginning of the birth pains. How long they will last, he doesn't tell them. Jesus is just saying to them that there's going to be a period of suffering and he wants them to expect it because he doesn't want them to worry. He wants them to be focused on the task that he's going to give them. Verse 9. Then you'll be handed over and persecuted and put to death and you'll be hated by all nations because of me. Again, when we read verse 9, Jesus is talking to the disciples. Not to you or to me. You, the disciples, are going to be handed over and put to death. You, the disciples are going to be hated by all nations. Let's look at Mark's account of the same conversation in Mark 13, 9, and 10, and I want you to listen to how this is worded. You must be on your guard. You'll be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues. On account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses before them, and the gospel must be preached to all nations. Now, way back in Matthew 10, anybody remember Matthew 10? It's a long time ago, wasn't it? Jesus is getting his disciples ready to be sent out. He is warning them about persecution. Here it is, and I've got both passages on the screen, Mark 13 and Matthew 10, 10 verses 17 and 18. Be on your guard. You'll be handed over to the local councils and be flogged in the synagogues. On account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and the Gentiles. Now, Mark's account of this discussion with Jesus on the Mount of Olives matches Matthew's chapter 10 almost word for word. But when Matthew writes his account in Matthew 24, it's very straightforward and very to the point. There seems to be a real sense of urgencies in Matthew's writing. Now, before verse 9, Jesus is talking in generalities. 
But starting with verse 9, he's talking and warning them about stuff that's much more specific. He's, this is directly directed at the disciples about things that are going to happen to them because of him. Now, before 64 AD, I couldn't find a lot of recorded history about direct persecution of Christians outside of the Jewish persecution that they faced. But after 64 AD, it's a different story. That's when the great fire in Rome happened. Nero falsely blames the Christians for the fire that nearly destroys Rome, and persecution of Christians becomes widespread in the Roman Empire. This persecution is carried out by the Roman government, and anyone who decides it's kick a Christian day in the empire, if the government can do it, must be okay for everyone to do it. And Rome controlled so much of the known world at that time, you could say that almost all nations persecuted Christians because of Nero and Rome. Peter and Paul were executed in Rome, Philip elsewhere in the Roman Empire. Christians were killed in public executions for sport in the circus in Rome. And while Rome and Nero kicked the persecution into high gear all over the known world, over 200 years later, in 313 AD, Emperor Constantine the Great legalized Christianity in the Roman Empire. And in doing so, he also kicked the spread of Christianity around the known world into high gear. So Rome was largely responsible for Christian persecution as well as the spread of Christianity. Now there's a reason why Jesus, when Jesus is talking to the disciples, it feels like he's talking directly about Rome. It's because he is. Verses 10 and 11. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray, will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Now why would Jesus tell them this? Well, with the immense pressure that's going to be put on the, on the, from both the Jewish faith, the Pharisees and Sadducees and the Roman Empire, is going to, they're going to put on the Christian church, the early church. It makes sense that Jesus would give them this warning. Jesus knew that the people that were with them when things were good would quickly fall away as the heat gets turned up. And Jesus knows that the heat is about to get turned up. The unsettled times will allow false prophets to take advantage of people's fears. And way back in Matthew 7, Jesus gives this warning about false prophets. 15, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. Now the Old Testament is full of recordings of false prophets. 2 Kings 3.13, Isaiah 44.25, Jeremiah 23.16, Ezekiel 13.2-3, Micah 3.5, Zechariah 13.2-3. All these are recordings of false prophets claiming to receive messages from God, but they didn't. They just wanted, wanted to tell people what they wanted to hear, what the kings or the rulers that they were serving wanted to hear. Now this is a message that God gave through his prophet Zechariah, and this is harsh, and I want to give you fair warning, so if there's any tender ears listening, you might want to plug them for like 15 seconds. Zechariah 13, 2 and 3. On that day, I will banish the name of the Lord Almighty. I will remove both the prophet and the spirit of impurity from the land, and if anyone still prophesies, their father and mother to whom they were born will say, you must die because you have told lies in the Lord's name and their own parents shall stab the one who prophesies. Now that's a rough passage. But God is talking directly about removing prophets. Now there is a roughly 400 year time gap, the 400 silent years between the period covered in the Old Testament to the New Testament from Malachi in 420 to the appearance of John the Baptist. And in these 400 years, some say God would reveal nothing new to his people. This has nothing to do with this, but it is interesting. The period of the Second Temple was from about 530 B.C. to 70 A.D., which is almost the same timeline as the 400 silent years, which I'm not going to get into. I just thought I'd mention it just because it's interesting. So there's false prophets in the Old Testament. There's false prophets in Jesus' time, and that's what he's warning them about. And we have false prophets today. But Jesus decides to make sure he covers this again with them. He knows that there's going to be an increase in the number of false prophets that his di disciples have to deal with. And he knows this is going to cause a problem in the new church. And we have the advantage of hindsight. We have Paul's writings about false prophets in the new church. And we know what Jesus told them happened. He wanted to make sure that they had their guard up. Verse 12. Because the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. Now, I want you to think about wickedness. It's really the separation of what we want to do from what God wants us to do. The scribes, the Sadducees, the Pharisees have all been accused by Jesus of, being, of wickedness or of being wicked. 
These are Bible teachers and religious leaders in Jerusalem. But we have to remember that all of the characters in this story are living in Roman culture. And Roman culture is all about power and money, about satisfying yourself above, above others, about it's a culture ripe with debauchery, a culture that worshiped all sorts of gods because you can never have too many gods, right? Sound familiar? Sound a bit like the world we live in? Maybe more than a bit? But for some reason, this is the time that God chose for Jesus to live on this earth as a man. This is the world the disciples that the early, and the early church lived in. This is the world they would carry out Jesus' call for them to bring the gospel to all nations. At this time, the Roman Empire was just about the whole known world. And you know how the saying goes. When in Rome, you do as the Romans, right? Everybody's heard that saying before. Well, Jesus doesn't want his church, his new bride, doing the whole when in Rome thing. Now, if, the love, if love is the key to living out God's commands, love God, love people. Sound familiar, Mark? Love God, love people. Like, it's basically part of the greatest commands or the greatest commands that he gives in Matthew 22. Now, if love, if love is the key to living out God's command and the opposite of wickedness, that would mean that a love that has grown cold is moving from love to wickedness. The wickedness in this culture they live in is causing the love of most to grow cold, from being in love with God to falling out of love with God and into wickedness. And when Jesus is telling the disciples this, he's saying, you're either in love with God or you're in love with wickedness. There is no middle ground. And if you feel a bit offended by me saying this, that there's no middle ground, listen to what Jesus had to say in Revelations 2, 4, and 5. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Same message, right? You've fallen out of love and into wickedness. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Verse 13. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Matthew 10 22, and I have them both on the screen for you again. You will be hated by everyone because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. When the disciples heard this the first time, way back in Matthew 10, it probably didn't fully make sense to them. But when the disciples hear it this time, it's my guess that they would automatically connect the end with the destruction of the temple, which with where they're at in history would make some sense. Now, this verse is pretty straightforward. I'll the one who stands firm to the end doesn't really need a whole lot of explanation, so we're going to move to verse 14. And this, and, the, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Okay, this is where it gets interesting. Verses 13 and 14 show up kind of unexpectedly. Jesus is kind of shifting gears from verses 4 to, 4 to 12. Maybe he does this to give the disciples a glimmer of hope in a conversation that feels otherwise a bit threatening. And in verse 14, we see for the first time what Jesus has planned for his disciples. We see the same language Jesus uses again in Matthew 28 in the Great Commission. This idea that the gospel must be preached to all nations and then the king will return. This is an idea that some missionary groups have taken literally. Purposely targeting specific nations that would, has not been reached by the gospel with the sole thought that once all nations are reached or the whole world is reached, they will bring back the return of the Messiah. They're thinking that they have some control of all this. These groups are reading this packet passage and taking it very literally. Preach to all nations, then the end's going to come, and the end being Jesus' return. That's the thought process. But if we look a little deeper, it's not quite that simple. If we look at the Greek word here that's used for whole world, which I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce to save so I have some dignity left when I'm done, this word translated means inhabited world. So whole world means inhabited world. The same word is used in other places in the Bible. It's used for the area covered by the Roman Empire. Luke 2, 1 uses this word, and in Luke it's translated to the entire Roman Empire. So same word, different translations. The same word is used to describe how bad the famine was in the empire in Acts eleven twenty eight, as well as the extent of Artemis worship in Rome in Acts nineteen twenty seven. Now, the way the writers use this word suggests that we should be careful how literally we use it, even in terms of the known world at Jesus' time. 
What we need to keep in mind is the intent of the word here. The intent is that the gospel would be spread far beyond the, the borders of Judea. Well, you might be thinking to yourself, yeah, but the end, that's very clear. It has to mean Jesus' return. Well, we have to remember how this conversation gets started. In Matthew 24, 2, that Chad covered last week, do you see all these things, he asked. Truly, I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. This conversation they're having is about the destruction of the temple. That is what they're talking about. And if the end is referring to the destruction of the temple, and we know that the meaning of the Greek word for the whole world actually means inhabited world, one could argue that by the time the end came, or by the time the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, by this time, the gospel of the kingdom had already been preached to the known world. By the mid-50s, and not 1950s, but 50s, like 5-0, Paul and the apostles had already reached most or all of the known world. Paul had plans after Rome to go to Spain because they'd been everywhere else. Oh, went too far, sorry. Matthew 12, 6. I tell you something greater than the temple is here. Greater than the temple or replacing the temple is the church, Christ's bride. Remember last week when Chad said that his spirit is leaving the temple? This is where it's going, to the church. The church is a community of those who follow Jesus, right? It's us. We, the church, are united under the mission that Jesus has given us. It looks like God wanted his new church or his bride to be established before the destruction or the temple or the end. Remember the questions? Question, when will this happen? Answer, after the gospel has been preached to the inhabited world and when something greater than the temple, Christ's bride, has been established. Question, will the, what will be the signs of your coming in the end of the age? Answer, the end of the age is the end of the temple, and the end of the temple and the beginning of something greater. You might be sitting there thinking, wait, 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 wait. You didn't answer the first part of the second question. What will be the signs of your coming? This is what we all want to know, right? You're right, I didn't. And Jesus does not give his disciples an answer either. And maybe Jesus doesn't answer this in this conversation because his second coming, or his return, has nothing to do with this conversation. His return has nothing to do with the end or the destruction of the temple. Jesus does give us a very, very clear answer in Matthew 24, 36, but about that day or hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. I think you could call this an answer, right? Maybe you could call this a statement. Like really, church, how much clearer of an answer do you want? I think this one of the, it could be one of the most direct statements Jesus ever makes. He's telling us, you know what? The angels don't know, I don't know, only the Father knows. Church, if Jesus doesn't know, you really think that I was going to figure this out? C come on. <laughs> so today we spent a lot of time in the classroom, probably because I like that stuff. Maybe way too much for some. And we have a tiny bit of time for church at the end. So where does that all leave us? Well, today is the beginning of a group of passages in Matthew where Jesus starts to talk to his disciples about the destruction of the temple, about his return, about remaining watchful, about final judgment, and he throws a few parables in for good measure. And writing this, writing this was tough for me. This was a hard passage to deal with. When I was writing this, Shelley would ask me, how's your sermon coming? And my response would be, I'm struggling. I'm struggling to wrap my brain around this. I'm struggling to put the pieces together. I'm struggling to figure out how I want to word things. I'm just struggling. But as I continue to pray, and now that I'm done, and the writing is done, I think I know why. Any discussion about the end times is a bit of a tough discussion for our church. For me as well, we have been, what you might say, been there, done that. Somebody could have said amen on that one. For some of us, we would say, we've done way too much. I don't ever want to hear about the end times again. Unless Jesus is knocking at my door, I don't want to go there. Sunday rolls around. What's the sermon today? End times. Okay, I'll see you next week. It's a topic that brings with it fear and frustration, hurt and resentment. And as church leadership, we get it. We understand. But for others, it's a topic that we they can't get enough of. 
This group would want Chad's next sermon series to be on Revelation. They want to talk about trumpets and feasts and brides and new moons and old moons and signs and wonders, and it just keeps going and going. And it's a topic that's full of mystery and a topic that Jesus talks about a lot. But it's a topic that you're never going to get the answer you're looking for. And church, we're all looking for an answer, right? But we'll never be told when Jesus' return will be. He told us that directly. Only the Father knows. And as Chad moves us through this area of Matthew, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to think of the topic of the end times like a puzzle. Does anybody here like puzzles? I don't. I actually hate puzzles. But anyway. <laughs> I can ask Shelley. I want you to think of this as a puzzle. God has scattered all the puzzle pieces all over the Bible. He's got some in the Old Testament. He's got some in the New Testament. And as Chad starts to put some of these pieces in place for us, I want you to keep something in mind. When we think about the end times, we need to understand that God has kept some of the puzzle pieces. Yes, we got a box with missing pieces. This is a puzzle that we're never going to solve. No matter how great a, ch a teacher Chad is, he's not going to solve it for you. Because I guarantee, and Chad, you're awesome and I love you, but people, Chad is not ha or God is not handing Chad those pieces. He's just not. These are things for only the Father. Just think about how many Bible teachers work in this area. The theologians that study it, the preachers that preach about it, the books that have been written about it, the prophesying about it, all the times and dates that have been given to when this is going to happen, thousands of years of study and contemplating and worry and still we have no answer, but we do. But about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven or the sun, but only the Father. Church, there's a reason that God has told us all these things. There's a reason why all these things are written in the Bible. A reason why he sat on the Mount of Olives with his disciples and answered their questions he wants them to live and approach their mission like his return is coming any time with a sense of urgency. But he doesn't want them to worry. He didn't want them to spend their time working on a puzzle that they don't have all the pieces to. He lays out for them a lot of what is going to happen so they know what to expect. And why would he do this? Because he's about to entrust these 12 men <clears throat> with the most important mission this world will ever see. These 12 men will be sent out to make disciples of all nations. These men will be filled with the Holy Spirit and do things for Jesus for the mission to begin to prepare the world for his return. And he's telling them all these things so they don't worry. Because worry creates fear and fear creates doubt and doubt kills hope. Jesus wants to make sure that when these things happen, they don't lose their hope. He wants them to always have their hope. They don't know when he'll return, but Jesus gave the disciples the story, and he gave them the ending, and it's a good ending. Why? I know I'm going to sound a bit like a broken record, but this is important. Again, he didn't want them to worry about these things. He wanted them to remain filled with joy and hope that they know how this crazy story all ends, and he wants the same for us. Church, we're given the same mission as these 12 men, and we've got the same story that they were given. That's kind of a crazy thought, isn't it? And you can spend your time praying for Jesus' return and hope he comes back soon, and there's nothing wrong with doing this, but when you're doing this, I want you to keep something in mind. Be careful what you pray and what you wish for. Amos 5, 18 and 20 says, Woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. Why would you long for the day of the Lord? This day will be darkness, not light. It is though a man fled from a lion only to be met with a bear, by a bear, as though he entered his house and rested his hand on the wall, only to be, have a snake bite him. Will not the day of the Lord be darkness, not light, pitch dark, without a ray of brightness? Not everyone should be looking forward to this day. For all of those who are not ready, each day that Jesus doesn't come back is actually a day of grace. For each day that he doesn't return, a spouse, a family member, a co-worker, a friend, has another opportunity to receive salvation. And friends, this is the definition of God's grace. So church, pray and be thankful for these days of grace. We want to continue to be on our mission, but let's not waste our time worrying about what the future brings. Each day, let's continue <coughs> to be filled with the spirit and joy of hope. Each new day, knowing that there's another opportunity for someone you love to accept Christ's grace. 
And until that second he comes back, it's never too late. Let's do our part in the mission as Christ's church. Church, we know the story, we know the ending, and in the words of our tour, we win. And that church is a good answer. So we pray. God, we thank you for the opportunities you give us to study the Bible, Lord. We thank you for um, the grace, Lord, the never-ending grace for all those who have received salvation. It's hard not to look forward to that day, the day when, when you'll come back and we won't have to deal with all the stuff we have to deal with on this earth. But when we think about that, Lord, we want you to always remind us, too, that there are people who aren't ready for that time to come, people that aren't. We don't like to think about those things, but people that aren't ready for your return. And we just pray that that you would continue to be with us as a church because this is our mission, to reach those people. And we pray that as we continue to move forward with this, we just ask that your continued blessing and guidance be with us as a church, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen.
So Keith, how does it feel? To be done, it feels good. Yeah. Being done is always good. It was the same thing. You know, I was texting you. We always kind of text throughout the week, especially when you're preaching. And it was like, you weren't giving me all those positive, fuzzy uh, <laughs> messages that you normally do. So. All right. Does anybody here have any questions for Keith? Feel free to ask them. If not, you can go for lunch earlier. Yeah. It's a good incentive. <laughs> How do we protect ourselves from false prophets if they're giving us what we want to hear? Well, just because it's what we want to hear doesn't mean it's what's in the Bible. Again, c keep going back to that same, I think the only way for us to really discern that is to be, you know, in, in con contact with God or being in touch with God and being like knowing your Bible. I think it's really important. But what I... That, what happens if what they say is in the Bible? <laughs> okay, that's a question I don't know the answer to. Okay. I guess. I don't know. I don't not... I think the discernment that you have, God should give you that discernment. We're praying for that discernment. So then you're, you're saying community and humility. Yeah. How else, would, like, discernment is the only way that God tells us anything, right? Through the Holy Spirit. So that is the only way is through connection with God and through discernment and prayer, you know. And I think sometimes it's... I, the, the idea that us, us Christians, and we see it in other churches, that we're never going to be deceived, pretty hard. Like Paul says, right? People say what our itching ears want to hear. And if we're living a lifestyle that maybe doesn't, we're not supposed to be, or we're doing, th we all do things we're not supposed to do, right? And when people say, well, there's nothing wrong with that, that's okay, that's exactly what they're talking about, right? And is that person a false prophet? You might not think of that. Like it might be Shelley that tells me that, but it's that, you know, is she then a false prophet or a false teacher? Or is she just misleading me? You know what I mean? Like, does that make sense? Kind of? Sure. You have the Holy Spirit even with COVID, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just to repeat that, somebody in the congregation here said that, I mean, COVID is just a perfect example of, of a need for discernment and fact-checking fact checking and, and the gratitude we have that we have the Holy Spirit with it, us. Right? But it is hard. That's a really good example of something. It's maybe not a specifically a biblical thing, but everything's a biblical thing. But but it is hard because it, there's a lot of information out there. And how do you discern that? So I've, I've got a few questions on the stream now. I'll ask a few of those. From, from Joe? Two from Joe. <laughs> 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 yeah. First question, this is from Joe, faithful Jojo. Um, <laughs> Jesus calls us to be ready for his return. How do we practically prepare while not getting too focused on searching for signs? Well, I think we're called just to live our life and live out the mission that he's given us, right? I think sitting and worrying about it, think even, and for some people, I think they can think about it and dwell on it and it doesn't affect them. For others, it's not healthy to think about the end. We should be, we've been given the same message or mission that they've been given, right? And like Mark, it's pretty simple. Like his theme for the camp is love God, love people. And as a church, we just should be continuing to do what we need to do. You're supposed to go to work every day, right? Like you're supposed to continue doing the things, you know, and, and seek God's guidance. And, and So the best way to prepare for Jesus' return is to live out the mission of the church, be the church. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's... In your everyday life. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Joe's second question was, Keith, regarding the idea of the U.S. invading and occupying Canada. Now, Joe's an American. <laughs> he, he asks, have you ever seen the movie Canadian Bacon? I have not. Okay. Th this might be a good follow-up for you. <laughs> I, I say that, and this week, one of Trump's, in his government, said when they closed the border till August 21st, well, who wants to go to Canada anyway? So that's for Joe. <laughs> Did the disciples always uh, understand or take it seriously not to worry about the end times, or do we see signs of them worrying? Is that fair? Well, the disciples themselves all died, right? So, or except for John, but... They obviously took, like, if they were worried about it, it probably would have stopped them. Would, you know, fear creates doubt, doubt kills hope. If they, if, they, if they would have worried about it, I think they would have doubted what their mission was. They never would have followed through with it. I, I really do think that. Um, and we see the difference in them from before, you know, in Acts, as you move into after the, the Jesus resurrection, death and resurrection, um, we see the difference in, even in Peter is probably the most, the easy example to follow with the Holy Spirit or Paul, I guess both of them, the difference in Peter 
kind of floundering and saying all sorts of dumb things before, and right after he receives the Holy Spirit, he leaves 3,000 people to get baptized that same day. So I don't think that they're worrying about it. Now, when you're talking about people selling everything and in the early church, that was a problem. Because what happened, even later on, when they talked about when, when Paul is in, where is he? Who's the, Lydia, right? In the purple robe? Yeah. She's sending money back. And that's the reason why he's bringing money back to Jerusalem to support some of these people in this church because they've all sold what they had thinking that Jesus is coming back and he didn't come back right away, right? Um, yeah. So. Did you say God didn't die? Well, he died eventually, but yeah. yeah. I did say that, didn't I? The question was, did you say <laughs> Clarify, John, John did die. <laughs> John in the Bible. So another question from the screen. So in the Old Testament, false prophets said easy things the people wanted to hear, and the true, true prophets gave doom and warnings that were hard to hear but true. Is it the same today but reversed? So the question is, today do, do prophets tend to give good news and uh, false prophets give bad news? What's your opinion on that? Well, good news from the perspective of what we want to hear. I think it would have been the same then, right? Because at that time, if if they would have said, you know, you can worship this God of whatever, and God says it's okay, if that's what the false prophet is saying in the Old Testament, people probably have gone, oh, great, I can do that, and I don't have to worry about it. And it's kind of the same thing today, right? Because if somebody says, well, you don't have to go to church, you don't have to live in a church community to be Christian or to be saved, which is probably true. I mean, that's a really bad example, actually. But <laughs> I don't know an example of what, without getting really specific and getting into something I don't want to get into, you know, people hearing something that, that they like the way it hears because it affects how they live their life with something they want to do, which maybe they don't know, they know maybe isn't right. It, there are a lot of teachers out there who will teach that the church is corrupt and that you actually don't need it. Like you don't need that community. Yeah. And I think in that sense, it works. I, it tickles people's ears, right? That prosperity all, gospel is a yeah. really good example, actually, now I'm thinking sure. about it. Because their prosperity gospel tells you that God just wants you to be happy and to be wealthy and to have everything you ever wanted. All you got to do is pray and believe and give the church enough and give me as a pastor enough because I'm evangelizing. And the more you give, the more blessed you're going to be. And that, that really is a really good example of something that, that uh, isn't true. But tickles the ears, like it gives people what they want to hear. Sounds good though, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So to really put you on the hot seat, I have a political question for you from the stream. <laughs> It says, how does President Trump's push for faith in the country back into schools and into homes fall into this testament and the pushback from the evil sides that push for the things that are against the Bible? So how do you see maybe the culture war in American politics? Does this play into uh, searching for signs or, or, or what do you think? That's a hard one to answer because you don't know what someone's intention is. You, I, you know, personally, I like the idea, right, of of faith coming back into schools and in the country being talked about more in the country. But I'm not going to comment on someone's intentions because I have no idea what their intentions are with that. But it is, I think if any of us would say we don't like that idea, it's maybe because you don't like the person. You're not separating the idea from the person that you don't like. You know, like if anybody who's a Christian who says, well, I don't like it for this reason, you're just saying that because you don't like that person, which... God used all sorts of weird people. Like, like, again, I've been going through the Old Testament and weird countries, weird people. And you're talking about, you know, Assyria and Babylon and Egypt. He used all those people to punish other people, right? Yeah. So God can use anybody. Yeah. Sometimes it's the people you don't expect he uses the most. So, so maybe it kind of comes full circle that really it's just another matter of discernment. Mm -hmm. That you're really always discerning what's going on and you're checking your Bible, which, I mean, you should have a t-shirt that says check your Bible or something. And, like and if you think about it, if somebody says to you, well, pr for us, if somebody says a prayer is going to come back into the schools, be more prominent in our country, blah, 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 we should all go, well, that sounds good. Like, how can that be a bad thing, right? So thank you so much. Thank you for the questions in the stream and the questions here. Uh, you did a lot of work on that. You covered a lot of ground. So mm -hmm. bless you for it. And I think you tackled some stuff that really ministers to the heart of our church. It, it, you, you said we went to school, but it was a very pastoral sermon in a way. So I, I want to thank you for that as well. So thank you to everybody for checking in and God bless you.